Saturday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning. You're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live and I'm Alex Matthew. First, the headlines this morning. It's a muted start to trade in Asia as trade tensions continue to rise. Brent crude prices rise to a near two-month high after shipments from Iran fell to its lowest since 2016. Niti Aayog Vice Chairman Rajiv Kumar told Bloomberg Quint that the slowdown in the economy was not due to demonetization but due to the asset quality review that was conducted by the RBI in 2015-16 under Rajan. And market regulator SEBI will continue its probe of brokerage house Motilal Oswal over alleged mis-selling in the over 5,500 crore rupee NSCL scam. Now, emerging markets are definitely going to be in focus today. A lot of news points to talk about. They oh, rattled again at the start of the week with uh, the Argentine peso, uh, the Turkish lira and the Indonesian rupee, uh, rupiah actually uh, crash, uh, putting pressure on emerging markets worldwide. The negative sentiment uh, made a rough uh, summer for markets in August. But will September bring any relief? Garfield Reynolds of Bloomberg News reports. Uh, it, it's quite possible that uh, fall will bring a, a rather vicious harvest after that tough summer. Uh, we have all these idiosyncratic concerns mm -hmm. in Turkey, Argentina, the losses in Chinese stocks, uh, and, and also in non-emerging markets, difficulties in, in Europe. The difficulty is, across all of these, and Argentina, again, is a very good one to look at, is the way that the easy money of the past encouraged some big bets that are now being unwound because the regime has changed from the way it was when those big bets were made. So there's a lot of storm clouds out there, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm almost so bearish that I'm, I'm starting to think that I'm becoming a contrarian indicator <laughs> and that uh, sentiment <laughs> has gotten so down that uh, if, if we get a move back up, the relief rally could be quite startling. All right, well, that's a word coming in on the emerging markets. Remember, uh, there are a lot of new po news points that you have to pay attention to. Uh, there are updates in Brazil with regard to the elections that are coming up in October. There's also updates with regard to the monetary policy in uh, Turkey. Uh, and, and finally, there's also an update with regard to uh, the other uh, major market, that is the Argentine market, uh, and uh, the move towards a balanced budget there. But let's take a quick check on the Asian markets. As of now, uh, remember the Chinese benchmarks have just about opened up, so uh, we'll have to wait for the dust to settle to really tell you which way they are headed. As of now, it seems to be a, a, a mixed sort of a start. You have uh, the benchmarks heading in opposite directions in very narrow, uh, in a very narrow range, uh, both positive and negative. Uh, in the first few minutes of trade, you have the Hang Seng that's down about seven tenths of a percent. Uh, so the selling continues in that market. And you have the early risers that were uh, also down in, in early trade. You had the Nikkei in uh, Japan that was down about three tenths of a percent. It continues to remain under pressure. You have uh, the benchmark in Australia uh, that has cuts of about uh, half a percent. And you have the Kospi that's trading just about flat in early trade as of now. With that, let's turn to Darshan Mehta for the trade setup for the day in India and also to tell you what's happening in the futures and options space. Uh, well, Darshan, you know, a lot of people are talking about the uh, contrariness of the fact that you have the equity markets that are at an all-time high and the rupee and the bond market that are in so much pressure. We saw a huge sell-off yesterday in the second half. How is it looking today? So, so basically what we said, we had a terrible opening to the September series. Uh, historically, if you see in the last uh, three, uh, three Septembers that we saw the last three years, uh, they've had negative returns on, on the Nifty. So uh, again, this probably could be the fourth year, fourth month if, if this trend continues. So yesterday there was a big sell-off. US markets were shut yesterday. We didn't have any cues from them. And the executive Nifty has indicated a muting start 
but at this point of time. So I wouldn't say I would have the most positive view, but uh, nevertheless, the SGX Nifty is indicating a weak start at this point of time. Uh, and one of the reasons is that, you know, the benchmark and, and, the, and, the, and the reasons why the Nifty moved up, the heavyweights are not contributing at this point of time. So that's the SGX Nifty for you. A big cut coming in, 100-point cut on the Nifty. But surprisingly, you know, uh, the mid caps and small caps didn't fall. Uh, and the reason here is that now heavyweights, which had run up significantly, are seeing correction. You've seen how Bajaj Finance is corrected, how Maruti is corrected. So there is enough uh, selling pressure that's going on. As far as some of the sectors are concerned, all the sectors, in fact, the bank and the bank Nifty were also down close to 1% in trade. Uh, the Nifty Bank and the Nifty PSU Bank. Metal pretty much was one of the only counters which, which actually managed to buck the trend. It was up almost four tenths of a percent, uh, managed to end up in the positive bias, but there was heavy selling. Uh, look at the FMCG pack. Uh, that was down almost 4% or 3% in trade. Uh, energy was down 1%. And you know, counters like Britannia and Nestle, uh, which have run up significantly, uh, they are seeing correction that's coming in. HUL was down almost 4% in trade yesterday. So there is selling pressure that's coming in on the FMCG index. As far as this year-to-date performance is concerned, IT, FMCG and Sensex are the three indices that we need to watch out for. FMCG has had a good run of late. And overall, if you look at it, uh, despite the run that we've seen in the mid-cap and small cap right now, the small cap media and the realty, realty index have actually been the biggest underperformers this, this year itself. Now, as far as flows are concerned, yesterday FIs, DIs, both of them were net sellers. Uh, what we've seen as far as uh, the flows are concerned, uh, on a year-to-date basis, what we've seen is FIs have bought in 69,000 crores. DI, FIs have been net sellers as far as this entire year is concerned. Now, if you're looking at the other trends, what contributed to the Nifty, yeah, you can see that basically it was uh, the FMCG pack. HUL, ITC, both of them have sizable weights on the Nifty. They saw selling. ICICI Bank has a big weight on the Bank Nifty. That saw selling. And Reliance is one of the largest components of the Nifty, and that didn't contribute. So that was down. On the gaining end, uh, you've seen that you know uh, a little bit of leadership position coming in from the HDFC twins after marked uh, underperformers that we've seen. Dr. Eddy is not a big weight. Uh, Aisha Motors is not a big weight. So uh, even despite they're moving almost 4 to 5%, uh, they were not able to shift the needle on the Nifty itself. Now, uh, how did the FNO market pan out in trade? Uh, it was uh, the second day of the series. Uh, fresh short positions were seen. Open interest built up of almost half a percent, and that too on the short side. So 11,640. The Nifty Bank also saw fresh shorts. Open interest build up was almost 4.5% for the Nifty Bank. Uh, now, where are positions being taken? We are at 11,600 in trade. What we're seeing is that despite the sell-off that came in yesterday, put writers are still active at 11,600 and 11,700, and call writers are writing in at 11,700 and 11,800. So it, it seems that 11,700 is having a little bit of resistance for the market at this point of time. What happened yesterday call writers would have been much more active on than the, than the put writers. Despite selling, put writers didn't unwind positions at 11,600, 11,700, but call writers were more aggressive on the 11,800 mark, which they mean that, you know, they want to give that 100 point uptick uh, or gap uh, before, you know, selling actually comes in on the Nifty. Now, as far as uh, the PCR is concerned, the Nifty PCR fell in because the Nifty was rather weak in trade. Let's look at the bank Nifty PCR and that actually came in at 0 0.74. There are no stocks in the FNO ban at this point of time. It's start of a new series, but a couple of stocks that I want to watch out for. Wipros are fresh buying on high open interest, build up of 14% post the $1.5 billion order that it got. Uh, the other counter that I want to talk about is Escorts. Uh, weak uh, sales numbers, open interest build up of 19%, that too on the short side. And finally, the last stock that I want to talk about is Balkrishna Industries. 19% uh, open interest build up, so counter down 7% on the surprise capex that they announced. Uh, overall, uh, uh, Alex, we're seeing that the market trend, uh, at least of today, is looking slightly wobbly. Mm. All right. Well, a lot of people are actually asking for an outlook on the Nifty, and I said that you were just talking about exactly that. Thanks so much for that, Tarshan. Well, let's take a check on the rupee and the bond market. Saloni Dhanuka is joining us with all the updates there. Saloni, those are the two markets that have been under tremendous pressure. In fact, yesterday saw a huge sell-off in the second half. How are they looking? So, Alex, uh, the rupee yesterday crashed to yet another historic low of 71.21 levels against the dollar. Now, as you clearly said, uh, the home currency did open with strong gains uh, yesterday morning, largely on the back of uh, better-than-expected GDP data. However, it reversed all its gains and ended three-tenths of a percent lower versus the dollar. Concerns over rising crude oil prices along with strong dollar demand and trade war tensions continue to hurt foreign exchange market sentiments on uh, 
speaking of the bond market, sovereign bonds extended decline as yields climbed for the sixth straight session, uh, its longest uh, streak since a year. Ten-year benchmark bond yield rose nearly five basis point yesterday to end at eight percent, uh, its highest since uh, 11th June. Uh, traders do believe that strong GDP print uh, is actually uh, negative for the bond market as it increases expectations of a rate hike uh, uh, by the traders by by RBI in the near term. On the global front, dollar index ended flat and it is now trading marginally higher in the early Asian hours, uh, well above the 95 mark. Uh, uh, well, if you see pound, it uh, trades uh, lower for the third straight session versus the dollar, largely on the back of Brexit uncertainty and also due to weak manufacturing data in August. Uh, also, euro slipped one tenth of a percent lower versus the dollar yesterday after eurozone manufacturing data showed uh, its uh, activity slowed down to its lowest level in nearly two years. And lastly, if you see dollar rupee now, it is trading flat in the non-deliverable forward markets, which indicates a flat opening for Indian rupee in today's trade, Alex. All right, thanks so much for that, Saloni. Now, Niti Aayog Vice Chairman Rajiv Kumar says that the economic growth in six quarters slowed down due to rise in non-performing assets and not the 2016 demonetization drive. Speaking to Bloomberg Quint's Tamannan Inamdar, he, uh, Kumar added that no conclusive proof was established uh, of a link between the economic slowdown and demonetization. Here's a slice of that conversation. It is also a fact that a lot of people who had the wherewithal uh, did not really feel the heat of demonetization. Perhaps the same set of people for whom it was aimed. Uh, a lot of people found loopholes out of the system. Some, as you mentioned, by being, paying salaries in uh, cash in advance. Uh, others found other means to get around it. At the end of the day, after these figures, people are still asking what good did it do? As I said, I was one of the first to have supported it, I continue to support it, and I and I support it for non-economic grounds as well because the prime. I was just told that the prime minister had used in his speech of November 9th the word corruption 16 times because the, one of the basic objectives, one of the principal objectives of demonetization was to was to push back this culture of you know this culture of complete dishonesty and you know and 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 and, and non tax compliance etc and reintroduce some probity integrity and honesty in our society in our system i mean the, the, the fact is and nobody but nobody can deny it that ever since that day you had you have had you had a change in the culture you had a change in the whole sense in which people are going about their economic businesses and the fact remains that you've had a growth in both the tax base and in the tax collections and in the fact that the 23,000, about 23,000 crore has been seized over and above the 13,000 that was not returned. Why do we keep this narrative going on? No, the, the reason is, the reason is sir, with all due respect, the change of the culture you're talking about. Sir, with all due respect, the change of culture you're talking about, and I'm glad you brought out the theme of corruption. That was the basic uh, reason why demonetization uh, was implemented. Where is the evidence uh, to back the claim that corruption has now reduced in this country? On a day-to-day -day level, on an everyday level, I think if anyone conducts a straw I mean, if, poll if in and around them, the, they feel they still have the, to go through it. If you, if you can't see the evidence, Tamanna, I must say you must be being purposely blind. The watering holes of Delhi and Mumbai and Bangalore have stopped. There is no high-level corruption in any of the government deals, in any of the government procurement that you can think about. People, you constantly bring back petty corruption of the, of the, of, 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 on the street or what is called the speed money. And even there, even there, a large number of services have now been put online so that people don't have to pay the speed money to the people concerned, including registration of your land properties, etc., as well as the reimbursement of your tax refunds and so on. Demonetization has not had the kind of negative Negative effects of 1.5 percent GDP growth rate being shaved off, etc., etc. That's just a completely false narrative. Instead, we now have a much more formal, clear, cleaner, uh, tax-compliant economy, which will enable us to sustain high rates of growth without the boom and burst cycle that we've had in the past. 
Well, that's just one of several issues that will be major talking points going into the 2019 elections. And of course, the other major talking point is going to be oil and, and petrol and diesel prices, which, by the way, are at all-time highs. Let's shift focus now and speak about commodities. Jesh Kilani is here with all the updates there. Jesh, crude under pressure again on the upside. That's right. In fact, uh, Alex, uh, so Brent oil has neared uh, or inched upwards towards the two-month high, uh, primarily on the back of uh, the Iran exports that we have seen. Uh, those have, in fact, uh, you know, declined since 2016. Uh, so Iran, in fact, exported uh, uh, to less than uh, 2.1 million barrels a day. That was the positive for uh, the oil markets, and, and that's the reason we saw an uptick in the oil prices. Uh, once again, uh, you know, inching up towards the two-month high. Uh, but as far as base metals are concerned, the index itself declined for the fourth straight day on the London Metal Exchange. Uh, now this was, uh, you know, largely. Uh, led by, in fact, uh, the base metal lead, which bucked the trend and ended about 2% higher on the back of inventory data. Uh, so the LME lead inventory uh, declined the most since March 2016. And we had aluminium, which declined more than 1% each. Uh, as you know, once again, the trade war concerns have uh, spurred back into uh, action. Uh, as far as uh, other base metals are concerned, uh, the likes of zinc and copper closed little change. Now, if you look at uh, the uh, base metals in uh, Shanghai, uh, those are in fact trading with a negative bias, though not by much. Uh, lastly, when you look at uh, gold prices, uh, you know, largely stable near the 1200 mark uh, on the back of a dip in the volumes that we saw uh, on account of the holiday in the US market yesterday. All right, uh, thanks so much for that, Jesh. And, and speaking about the fact that Brent oil rose to the highest level in almost two months in London, uh, the reason or the most recent uptick in uh, crude oil prices is centrally uh, the fact that Iran crude or exports tumbled with Asian buyers taking fewer cargoes from the Middle Eastern nation we uh, weeks before U.S. sanctions take full effect. Uh, Bloomberg's Anna Kitanka reports. There's a lot of focus on the Asian market because um, Asia is uh, the world's biggest buyer of crude at the moment. Um, and initially, China and um, India had come out and they were they were pushing back quite strongly against the US, um, arguing that they don't want to cut their imports from uh, Iran. But the reality is that they have actually started cutting. Um, I think the Chinese um, refiners have said their ships aren't going to carry their uh, Iranian crude anymore. Um, also, South Korea have reduced substantially and Japan's said that September would probably be their last cargoes that they're going to import from Iran. Um, so even though a lot of com uh, countries seem like they were quite against what Trump was doing, um, the reality is that they're having to cut back now. All right. Well, that's the update on uh, crude oil prices. Uh, but uh, what are the other stocks that you have to watch out for in news today? The stocks in news. Shraddha Babla is joining us now to tell you all about that. Good morning, Shraddha. Good morning, Alex. We are addressing crude oil prices and uh, the first stock on my list is Jet Airways. Uh, Ikra has downgraded the stock's uh, long-term rating to double B from a uh, double B plus and they have revised the short-term rating from A4. Uh, uh, from A4 plus to A4 and they've given a negative outlook citing that significant rise in the jet fuel prices and no corresponding increase in the airfares which has impacted the financial performance of the company and uh, remember this is the second time just in a four month period where the rating agency has downgraded uh, Jet Airways credit rating citing the same reason so that's one stock to watch out for. Persistent Systems US Arm has uh, made a small acquisition they've bought 100% stake in Herald Technologies for 5 points two million dollars that's about 35 to 40 crores a small acquisition nevertheless we'll continue to watch for a reaction on that one you also have VST Tillers, which has reported its uh, monthly sales for August. The total sales have taken a big hit. They're down 18.6% to 2163 units. Uh, this is mainly on account of tractor sales uh, nearly halving to 517 units. Uh, also keep an eye out for IDBI Bank. Remember, the LIC board is going to meet today to decide on the IDBI stake hike uh, plan. It's expected to discuss uh, the timeline for the open offer board level appointments and 
future future strategy for revitalizing the bank so that's another stock to watch out for you also have hikal limited which will be in focus ashish kacholia has acquired 1.62% stake in a bulk deal yesterday himalaya finance and investment company has acquired the 1.44% stake and the international finance corporation of i or ifc has sold 3.23% the stock has already ended 14 15% higher yesterday uh, but it could probably react on a Uh, further on Ashish Kacholia's name, and lastly, Kaloskar Brothers, not a very liquid stock, but the promoter there has uh, uh, picked up an additional 0.4% stake from the market. Uh, they've bought uh, on August 30 to 31st. So the promoter holding is now up from 65.52 to 65.92. So that's another stock that uh, you can keep an eye out for. All right, thanks so much for that, Shweta. Now, Somit Sarkar is joining us uh, with the big brokerage calls of the day. Good morning, Somit. What do you have for us this morning? Good morning, Alex. On the big brokerage calls for the day, first we have is IDBI Capital on Moltec Packaging. Now, the brokerage has initiated coverage on the stock with a buy rating and a target price of 377, which suggests a potential upside of nearly 18%. A strong foothold in in-mold labeling and in-house backward operation integration is the key catalyst for future growth when it comes to Moltec Packaging, says the brokerage. Now, in the past, the company had focused on capacity addition, and this timely compa- completion of capacity capacity addition. Augurs well for the company on the back of the growing demand. Now the growth in paints, lube, and food and FMCG industry would support healthy earnings growth for the company going forward. Lastly, the brokerage is expecting the company's revenue, EBITDA, and net profit to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 21%, 27%, and 31% for FI 18 to FI 20. Second, we have a Scotec on City Union Bank. Now, the brokerage has cut the rating on the stock to reduce from ad, but have raised, raised the target price to 200 from 190, which suggests a potential upside of only 2 percent. Now, the brokerage has cut the rating on the stock due to the recent rally, which leaves no upside on the bank. Now, the rally could be on the back of receding con- uh, concerns on asset quality, loan growth, and operating cost, says the brokerage. However, for the bank, there have been new concerns, says the brokerage, like the rising interest rate and its inability to pass on this cost to consumers which could lead to a weaker net interest income growth going forward lastly the brokerage says that contraction in return on equity and valuation expansion does not bode well for the bank all right uh, thanks so much for that uh, somit uh, let's talk about a couple of stories that you will find if you look up the website bloombergprint.com uh, of course you'll find all the live market action over the course of the day and you should pay attention to all three i'm talking about the equity uh, bond and the rupee market the currency market over the course of the day uh, but have a look at these stories us defense secretary jim mattis and secretary of state michael pompeo traveled to new delhi this week in an effort to seal a new defense cooperation agreement with their indian counterparts despite tensions over threatened american sanctions now the meeting is slated for day after tomorrow looming large is the prospect that the us will impose economic sanctions on india unless it significantly reduces purchases of oil from iran and cancels a planned 6 billion dollar purchase of s400 anti aircraft missiles from a- uh, from russia indian officials have by the way said that the russian arms deal would go ahead as planned Foreign funds have started winding up or reworking their structure after India's market regulator barred non-resident Indians from controlling them. That's a source-based uh, report on a Bloomberg Quint. In other news on the market's regulator, SEBI has dismissed questions over its jurisdiction in its probe into alleged mis-selling by five brokerages in the over 5500 crore rupee payments scam at the erstwhile National Spot Exchange. Now some of you may be quite upset about the fact that there's no Premier League that's taking place this weekend but speaking of football nearly 60 million people apparently play fantasy football where they assemble imaginary or virtual teams of real players and it turns out that it's a super lucrative business here's some st- statistics about the people who are running fantasy sports In 2017, nearly 60 million people played fantasy sports in the US and Canada. That's according to the Fantasy Sports Trade Association, who points out that in 2015, 40 million people were playing fantasy football alone. So who plays fantasy sports? Well, more men play than women, with 71% of all fantasy sports players being male. The average age of a player is 32 years old. 
and 53% of players make a salary of $75,000 or more a year, while 67% are employed full-time. Each player spends an average of $653 a year on fantasy sports, with 70% of players participating in a league that charges a fee. And while fantasy sports is a lucrative business, football comes out on top by a long shot, commanding $18.6 billion of the market. All right, I hope you've got your teams uh, in place for the next weekend. Thank you so much for watching. This is Bloomberg Quint.